Amen. Thank you, church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you know that we are in troubled times, in troubled waters, but your vessel floats forever, and we can always cling to it like a life preserver no matter what happens. And we know that whatever the results of this week's events, it is Jesus who sits on the throne above all. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening, church. It's good to be back. Amen. It's good to, it's good to be back. Um, uh, I'm excited to be here on this Wednesday night uh, service. Uh, as uh, Tyron said, this is uh, some tumultuous time for our country. And, uh, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time tonight in prayer, uh, calling out to the Lord and asking for several things. Number one, that there would be peace across our land. Uh, we know that there's only going to be peace if Jesus Christ can get a hold of more people. Uh, there's rumors of wars and wars. There's rumors of all these things that uh, since the days of Jesus, since the days of Noah, have been going on throughout these six to 8,000 years that we live, uh, not just here in America, but in the world. And so it should be no surprising to us that uh, when two opposing parties disagree as much as they do right now, that there's going to be uh, tumultuous times. Uh, however, it's not our job as a Christian to... Um, try to understand why it's going on, try to change why it's going on, but it's our job as a Christian to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and know that he is still on the throne. And the only way that we can change on or do something different about it is by calling unto the Lord and saying, God, you fix what is broken. And so we live in a fallen, sinful state, and it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you find yourself on, Democratic Republic, uh, we are fallen people. And so we need to call upon the Lord to have him do something uh, great in our land. We don't need a political revival, we need a spiritual revival. And here's the deal. Uh, the scripture says that if the salt has lost its savor, it is good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of man. And here's the deal. If you're a born-again believer, if you love Jesus Christ with all of your heart, with all of your soul, uh, then your job is to be salty in the world. What does that mean? It means that you are not going to stop the decay of the world, but you could slow it down by the Word of God living through you. And so let's take a couple of moments this evening as our country is reeling from an election, uh, some are happy, some are not. Uh, some think it's fair, some think that it's stolen. Uh, there's many people on different sides, and I'm not here to talk politics tonight, but I am here to tell you that Jesus loves you and Jesus is still on the throne. And if you're not sure that when you're gonna die, you go to heaven, Jesus Christ paid the penalty on the cross of Calvary for you, that you could have eternal life. And so it's our job as believers in Jesus Christ that we take the time and pray and ask God to do great things for our country. And so let's do that tonight. Let's take a moment uh, and I'll pray and we'll ask God to uh, bless this mighty land in which we live in and that he would be the one that would see uh, great things to be done. Uh, amen? Let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we know not what tomorrow may bring, but our Heavenly Father, we know that you know yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so, Lord, uh, we love this land, and we want to see Jesus Christ's name exalted and glorified throughout this land. In fact, the model prayer that you gave us begins with this, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, how often do we forget that you have a will that you would like to see accomplished here on earth? Lord, when the chosen nation of Israel made a grave mistake and decided to not have you be their leader anymore, but they wanted a king, it began the downward spiral of man's dependent upon an election and promotion as opposed to a the the theology ruling God. So, Father, I pray that you would be the one that we would seek this election. That if we want to see changes and we want to th see things be accomplished, we would not 
look to the politicians to get it done, but we would look to the Bible and that we would seek your face. Lord, right now there's planned riots to go all around our country, most of them in the major cities. And Lord, I don't know what tomorrow beholds, but I know this. It is not your will for there to be riots all across our land. You may allow it to happen, but that does not mean it's your will. Lord, I don't know what your will is with this current political election, but I know your will is is that whatever you do in heaven, you want to be done here on earth. So Father God, I pray that you'd raise up young men and women in their teens, in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, 50s, and 60s to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus that we would see more people come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and lives would be changed that way. Lord, we know that politics divides. We know that the media wants to teach us that there's a race division, that there's a ethnic division, that there's a social division, that there's an economic division. But Father God in heaven, I know that in the book of Genesis, all throughout the whole Bible into the book of Revelation, there is one race, the human race. And you pretty profoundly told us to love thy neighbor as thyself. So Lord, today I pray that we would love our neighbor as you desire us to love our neighbor. So Lord, help us to get through this time that we're having. your will would be accomplished. Lord, I pray that if it's a fair election, that your name would be glorified. I pray that if it's a rigged election, your name would still be glorified. Father, whatever your will is, I pray that you would accomplish it quickly and that people would see how amazing and miraculous and wonderful you are. Father, thank you for what you've done in our country so far. Thank you for what you're doing in our city and in our church. God, I pray tonight that there would be peace in our land and that more churches would get on fire for Jesus Christ and would stop pretending to be a church, stop compromising and being complacent, and would be contagious and on fire for you. Lord, let us look to Scripture tonight as we find some verses in the Bible from a topical perspective that would help us chart these uncharted waters. Again, Jesus, I pray that you would do a great and mighty work in our nation, that you would send revival all across this land. And Father, I don't know what tomorrow beholds, but I know you do. And so Lord, help us to have the understanding and the peace and the joy that we only get from knowing you intimately. We love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want you to turn with me tonight. We're going to have uh, about 10 points if we can get all through all 10 of them. But I'd like you to turn, uh, turn with me to Proverbs chapter number 3. Proverbs chapter number 3. And we're going to look at verse number 5 and verse number 6. Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 5, verse number 6. Probably a pretty familiar memory verse that many of you have, might have learned uh, growing up in your Christian walk. But Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 5 and 6 says this. Trust in the presidency. Trust in the election. Trust in the politicians. Trust in the government. Is that what it says? But how many of us trust in the politicians? How many of us trust in the government? How many of us trust in the election? You see, the problem that we see in America with Bible-believing Christians is this. We put our faith and our trust in the wrong things, the things we shouldn't be trusting in. So that's why we need to go back to the beginning and go back and see what God tells us to put our faith and our trust in. And look what it says tonight. The Lord with all thy heart. Don't trust the Lord a little bit. Don't trust the Lord just a, just a medium bit, but trust in the Lord with what? All that you have. 
Now listen, there's some people, they go all in for politics, they go all in for the football team, they go all in for the sale on Black Friday, they go all in for all of these things, but yet they don't go all in for the Lord. There's a lot of Bible-believing Christians who are sitting on the pews and not all in for Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that the problems we face in America, it's not Donald Trump's fault and it's not Joe Biden's fault. It is the problem of Christians who are sitting on their hands not doing what God wants them to do. Welcome back. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and what? And lean not into thy own understanding. Listen, don't lean into things that you think is going to happen. Don't lean into things that you know, but lean unto the Lord. What do you mean? Bow your ear and say, Lord, what, what do you want to teach me today? What can I understand? Help me to understand and learn some things. And then it says, look, verse number six, in all thy ways, in all, 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 all thy ways, what? Acknowledge him. How often do we wake up and we just go through our day every day, we do what we want to do, but we don't acknowledge the Lord and say, Lord, what will you have me to do? How many of you drove here tonight? You drove here? Yeah, you drove here tonight? Yeah, you drove here tonight? How many of you said, Lord, which way do you want me to take tonight? You didn't. Some of you just got in the car, you went on autopilot. You just did your own thing. But you realize that God wants us to acknowledge him in all that we do? Not just driving. How about eating? How about talking? Lord, what do you want me to say? We had a very important phone call today with a, uh, an individual, and I, and I prayed with this individual before he got on the phone, and I said, listen, I said, you're about to have a make it or break it conversation. You're about to talk to someone who is either going to listen to you or they're going to they're gonna buck everything you're going to say. There's, there's, there's no in between. And so if you go with what you think to say, you're probably going to get bucked. But if you listen to the Lord and you lean unto him and you ask him to give you wisdom in the words from on high, watch the power that can rest upon you and watch what God can do. 30 minutes after that phone call, that individual called me and he said, it worked. God gave us what we were looking for. All glory goes to God. Listen, when you lean unto the Lord and you acknowledge him in all of your ways, he is the one who's going to direct your path. You may be facing that Jordan River moment. You may have the Pharaoh's army behind you and there's nothing you can do but look up and say, God, what will you have me to do? And God will part the waters and allow you to cross over to the other side. Listen, America is at at that moment. America is at a place, is at a crossroads, perhaps for the first time in our history, if we are going to see God do something great in our nation, it's going to take Bible-believing individuals, saved Christians who understand the true knowledge of salvation, who understand Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and they have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's going to take true Christians who sit there and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do, and who get on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. In all the ways acknowledge him and he shall what? Direct. Direct thy paths. Listen to that word P-A-T-H-S means plural. That you're going to go through things each and every day and God wants to direct you where you need to go, who you need to see, how you need to talk, what you need to speak to, how you need to communicate. My wife and I we went out to this beautiful restaurant in Aruba, overlooked the whole island next to this big, beautiful lighthouse, and we're sitting there, and we order filet mignon. It's the last night there, and the filet mignon's wrapped in bacon, and it's, it's delicious, and I'm waiting for the bill, and 20 minutes goes by, the bill doesn't come. 30 minutes goes by, the bill doesn't come. And all of a sudden they bring over a dessert menu and I'm like, for the love of Jesus Christ, I just want to get out of here. Lord, please give me the grace to deal with this slow pace. I just want it to bounce. I mean, you understand, you don't, want, you don't want to be there anymore. Uh, and it's not that I don't want to be with my wife, it's just the dinner was already an hour and 45 minutes long. And so dinner comes, and they bring over this surprise dessert to my wife for our anniversary, and it was just a beautiful thing, and we enjoyed it. Uh, and I just kept saying to her, why are we not leaving? We should leave now. It's time to go. What, we should go do things. It's our last night in the island. Let's go have fun. And I'm going through all of these things, and she's like, just relax. Just relax. Just relax. And so I end up paying the bill two and a half hours later, and I'm like, this is crazy. We're driving back to the hotel to drop the car off. And all of a sudden, I pull the car in, and this guy pulls in behind me, and his car is on fire. Fire. 
fire. And I reach into the car and there's a water bottle in the middle of my car. And I grab the water bottle and I give it to the guy and he puts the, car, he puts the fire out in his car. And I turn to my wife and I said, that's why I took two and a half hours for dinner. That guy needed that water bottle to stop his car from being on fire. And I just walked away and I said, okay, God, in all thy ways, acknowledge thee and you'll direct our paths. You realize that there's going to be times in your life that you have no idea why God is doing what God is doing. He's still on the throne. Check this out. Let's go to verse number, let's go to the second thing. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. First Thessalonians chapter number five, verse number 18. Point number two. Number one, trust the Lord. Number two, point number 18, verse number 18, point number two. In everything, give thanks. How many of you thank the Lord this morning? How many of you watched the election all last night and began to thanking the Lord? How many of you said, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm, I'm just going to thank you? That's tough. Hey, if you're, if you're a Democrat, you're thanking God that you're getting what you're getting. If you're a Republican right now, you're, you don't want to thank God, but that's what he wants us to do. Doesn't the, the Bible say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Listen, we shouldn't rejoice every four years on election day if it goes one way or goes the other way, and you wanted to go one way and it went your way. That shouldn't be the only time you rejoice. You should rejoice every day. But look what it says. In everything give thanks, for this is what? The will of God. Listen, when you can find the small, tiresome, angry, frustrating moments to praise God, you're beginning to have the most amazing Christian journey you'll ever discover. Why? Because you will praise him when there's nothing that seems to be praiseable going on, but you will praise him because that's what he wants you to do. Why? Listen, when you can find something to praise God with, when everything else is going wrong, when it feels like the world is falling all around you, when it feels like the sky is falling and the ground is falling all around you, and you can praise God, you're beginning the Christian journey that God is looking for you to have. Why? Because when you begin to thank God and you have the attitude of gratitude and you're praising him for what's going on in your life, you discover deep, intimate things with God and that's what? He wants to communicate with you even though nothing's going right in your life at that moment. You ever had a very bad, no good, horrible, rotten, bad, just disgusting, angry, frustrating day? Yeah, I think we all have. What does God want at that moment as the same that he wants when you're on the mountaintop experience? He wants to talk. He wants to communicate. And so when you begin to thank God, you know what happens when you begin to thank God for what's going on in your life? It begins to change your stinking thinking. It begins to change your rotten attitude. You had a bad day, had a rotten day, had, a, had said some things you shouldn't have said, done some things you shouldn't have done, uh, heard some things you shouldn't have heard, watched some things you shouldn't have watched, said some things you shouldn't have said, but then when you begin to thank God, what did he begin to do? Change your perspective. Change your attitude, change your narrative, change your direction, change your course, change your, oh yeah, that's right, your path. Why? Because you're acknowledging him. Look what it says in Psalm, Psalm uh, uh, 52, Psalm 52. Now I'm dealing with my other Bibles being repaired. How many of you remember my Bible fell apart in the midst of me taking on the governor? Remember that? My Bible fell apart. I opened up my Bible one day and the leather came off. And so I'm using my backup Bible. So if it takes me a little longer to find the, the verses in the Bible, you've got to give me a little patience. Uh, but look what it says. Psalm 52, Psalm 52, sorry, Psalm 51, Psalm 51, uh, verse number 12. Psalm 51, verse number 12. Look what it says to me. It says this. Restore unto me the what? The joy. Listen, if you're a born-again believer, I mean, you, you, know, you know Christ is your Savior, you should have the biggest smile on your face when you walk into the grocery store, when you walk into the gas station, when you walk down the street, 
when you walk into the pizza place, when you find a Little Caesars. I mean, you should have the biggest smile on your face wherever you go. Why? You are a born-again believer. You are a Christian. And so there should be power resting upon you that is not upon the people that are around you unless they're saved too. But how do you get that? How do you get that? Look what it says. Restore unto me, what? The joy of my salvation. How many of you have ever seen a car show? You, you've seen a car show and you got the cars from the, the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and you, and you pull up and you're like, oh yeah, Emma, you remember those cars when you were a kid, right? Uh, right? So you pull up to those shows and you're like, oh, look at these cars, they're so beautiful. And it's, somebody has taken hours, hundreds of hours, thousands of hours possibly, and they've painted, they've restored, they've found this nut or this bolt or this windshield or this mirror or this reflector, this hubcap or this rim or this tire. And they have spent thousands of hours restoring this vehicle. And you get there and you're like, oh, wow, I remember. That's so beautiful. It's so amazing. They, what do they do? They restored something. Listen, the longer you spend in the word of God, the more restoration you will have in your life and the more people will say, wow, there's something amazing about that person. That person has a walk with God. That person has a talk with God. That person has God's ear. That person's doing something with God. But you know what? It's not just the pastor. It's not just the missionaries. It's not just the uh, Brother August Rosado that we had the last two Sundays or Brother Tyron preaching on Wednesday nights. It's not just Sean in the back uh, going to Bible college and graduating or Lisa who already graduated. It's not just the people who are quote unquote involved in the ministry. It's every single person in the body of Christ can have the same restoration process. Look what it says. Restore unto my brother the joy of his salvation? That's not what it says. Although we would be happy if sister so-and-so came in off the street and she hadn't been to church in a while because she had a disagreement with the pastor, we'd be happy if she came back and made things right with the pastor and she got things right with the church. We'd be happy for that. We would be happy that her, her, her joy was restored. But that's not what it's talking about. Look what it says. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. My, my salvation, right? So what do you do? Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Remember the day you first accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Remember that defining moment. Now, my kids, they got, the, praise God, they got saved at such a young age, amen? Praise God, my wife got saved when she was five or six, seven years old, got baptized a little bit at the time after that. Praise God she had that. But you know, my wife testifies, if you've ever been to one of her ladies' meetings, she testifies that as she was growing up, she didn't know if she truly meant it or if she or God when things were right. And so she would constantly say to the Lord, Lord, I mean it and I'm, I'm just going to get it settled and, and I'm going to get it all established. And what did she do? She was saying to the Lord, Lord, restore unto me that day that I first believed. Give me back what I first had. Listen, there's a lot of us who get saved. Boom, we're on fire. Wow! We get excited about the things of God. We're reading. We're praying. We're, we're giving money to the church. We're serving God. We pick up every paper. We got gospel tracts. And we, hey, how you doing? You start throwing gospel tracts around people. Right? You're just excited because you got Jesus. And then the honeymoon of salvation gets over real quick. And then the devil comes and knocking. Not today, Satan. Today's a new day. How about today? Not today, Satan. All right, Satan, come on in. What happens? You compromise. You, you, you miss a church service. You don't read for a day or two. You don't pray for a week or two. You don't get involved in the social things of the church. You pick up the bottle. Pick up the pills, pick up the porn, you pick up the bad attitude. You pick up those things that you took off and left on the altar and you bring them back in. And then there's not restoration because there's sin and sin corrupts, sin corrodes, sin is cantankerous. But notice what it says, restore unto me the joy Joy. Remember that day you first believed. I remember that day that when I was sitting in a prison cell and the pastor told me about Jesus Christ. And I remember understanding, oh, I'm not going to go to hell. Jesus loves me. I can go to heaven. Hallelujah. And I testify. It's in my testimony track. 
some of the best times I had in my life are the next 18 months that I spent in prison. Some of the best times. You say, how can that be? Why? I had the joy of the Lord from the tip of my toes to the edge of my nose, even though it's burnt right now, all the way to my hair when I had it. I had the joy of the Lord. Some of y'all need to get that joy back. Right? You say, how do I get that joy back? Go home tonight. Go to the kitchen. Open the drawer. Take out a butter knife and go to a socket and stick it right in. You'll get shocked. you get some joy. <laughs> right? No, no, don't do that, okay? Listen, that'll give you a different kind of joy. All right? That'll shock you and get you excited about things, right? Take, you want some joy? Take your tongue and stick it on a 9-volt battery. Ah, okay, that's not really joy. But when you say, Jesus, I want you to restore unto me the joy of my salvation, man, the Holy Spirit starts to work inside you. You get excited about things again. Hello? You get excited about things. You say it's a midweek service. What are you supposed to do during a midweek service? Get re-energized. From what? The world has been kicking your butt for the last three days, and God's like, hey, get excited about things again. Restoring to me the joy of my salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Listen, when, when you go back to the bondage of your sin, when you go back to that, that bondage, there's no joy. There's no free spirit. You're like in prison again. And God doesn't want you in prison. Listen, he bought you with a price and he set you free. And what does he want you to do? He wants you to live free. You know, the, the motto in New Hampshire is live free or die. And what is the whole thing about live free or die? It's one of the only states in the nation that you don't have to buckle up in. You don't have to buckle up. Why? You don't have to wear a motorcycle helmet. You can do pretty much whatever you want. Why? Live free or die. And that's the motto. Do what you want. As long as it's within reason, and you're not going to hurt somebody or harm somebody, you've got this free spirit that lives inside of you. And that's the whole motto. Listen, I'm going to tell you what. Jesus Christ knew the motto 2,000 years ago before New Hampshire knew the motto. Live free in Jesus Christ. How do you live free? You have got the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you that wants to do great things through you. So start letting the Holy Spirit run your life. Look what it says in Matthew chapter number 8. Matthew chapter number 8. And we find a, a perhaps a familiar story, maybe you're familiar with. But Matthew chapter 8, verse number 23. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 23, scripture says this. And when, he, and when he entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. So who's he? He is Jesus. His disciples are with him, and now he's in a boat. He's in a ship. All right, and he's going to be sailing across the Sea of, uh, uh, sea of Galilee. And uh, what, a, what a beautiful sea. I know when you think the Sea of Galilee, you think, oh, this is this huge, long, wide, narrow, deep, big sea. Uh, but when you actually get there and you realize you can see across the other side, you think this is pretty, this is pretty interesting. Uh, and you look to the right, you can see the edge. You look to the left, you can almost see the edge. Uh, but you can definitely look straight across. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty beautiful. So Jesus has disciples uh, follow him on a boat and look what they say. Him. Uh, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. There was a great storm in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Who was asleep? Jesus was asleep. So you got to understand, Jesus is in the boat, sleeping. His disciples are in the boat, and there's waters crashing all over the boat. Now, if you've never been on the ocean, you've got to go in the boat sometime. How many of you have been on a boat in the ocean? Been on a boat in the ocean? It's fun, it's fun. How many of you have been on a, like, you know, a moderate-sized boat? You know, 50-foot, 100-foot boat in the ocean? Like, you know, a deep-sea fishing boat or like a whale-watching boat? And you go out there, and it's supposed to be calm, cool, collect. You're supposed to see the, the whales jump out of the water or go fishing. Oh, this is amazing. But if you've ever been out on the ocean in a 50, 100-foot boat, and all of a sudden, the weather turns, turns, and all of a sudden, you've got 15-foot swells or 20 foot swells and it's going up and down and up and down everybody's inside going and they're just throwing up and, they, and there, there's no sleeping inside there's looking for a bucket to puke inside most people can't handle it and Jesus in this boat don't know how big the boat is but he's in this boat and there's water crashing all over the boat and Jesus is just resting peacefully and sleeping and look what the disciples did and the disciples came to him and awoke him saying Lord save us we perish now that's kind of funny so why, why do we think it's funny? Well, we're looking back at the story. They're with Jesus, the Savior of the world. He hadn't accomplished his mission yet, but yet they were saying, Lord, save us, we perish. Right? They were, they were afraid. And look what he says, verse number 26. And he said unto them, Why are you afraid? Why are you fearful? But he, he didn't end it there. O ye 
of little faith. Listen, now's not the time to fear what's going on in America. I don't know where you stand. I don't know if you're happy with what's going on or you're not happy with what's going on. Now's not the time to fear. When the wave of the election is crashing, when the conservatives want four more years of safety and security, and liberals want four years of open borders and all kinds of ungodly things, what does God want? God does not want you to be focused on the storm. God wants you to have faith that he will get you through the storm. You see, if we have four more years of conservative, being conservative, the Democrats are going to be up in arms. If we have four years of chaos with the Democrats, the Republicans are going to be up in arms. No matter what, there's a storm. No matter which way you go, there's a storm. But you know, we don't need to focus on the storm. What we need to do is focus on the one who can rebuke the storm and have faith that even though it seems like our world is crashing all around us and we don't know the end from the beginning right now, we don't know which way's up, we don't know which way's down, we know the one who saved us and his name is Jesus. Look what Jesus said. Why are you fearful? He asks a question. I love when Jesus asks questions that are not just yes or no questions. They're questions that require deep thought, like this. Why are you fearful? O oh, ye of little faith? He's asking another question. Are you fearful because you have little faith? I don't know where you are this evening, but are you afraid because you have little faith? Here's the deal. Let me, let me let you in on a little secret. God knows, and God knew, and God will always know who is going to win and who is going to lose. And God knows if there's going to be riots. God knows if there's going to be peace. God knows if there's going to be chaos. God knows if there's going to be tranquility. God knows if the stock market's going to plummet or it's going to break records. God knows... So what do you do? You have faith. Faith in what? Not the process, but faith in the Savior. Then he arose. What did he do? First, he rebuked the disciples. Oh, you have little faith. Why are you fearful? What did he do? He rebuked the disciples. He said, look, you're, afra you're afraid because you're fearful. You have little faith. What did he do? First, he rebuked his disciples. And then next, look what he did. He rebuked what? The winds and the sea. And notice there was what? Great calm. Hey, guess what tonight? Maybe you got the results you're looking for. Maybe you didn't. Maybe your finances are in chaos. Maybe your health is stormy. Maybe your marriage is getting closer to the rocks and it's being battered by the wind and the sea. Maybe you don't know who you should love, how you should talk, how you should walk. Maybe you don't know that you were made in the image of God. Maybe you don't understand that God has a plan and a principle for your life. Maybe you're sitting here today saying, why in the world am I in church on a Wednesday night? Be not afraid. Jesus is in control of the weather. He's in control of your finances. He's in control of your marriage, 
of your home, of the election, of the city, of the nation. He is in control. But I want you to realize something. The wind and the sea didn't calm down until Jesus was done rebuking the disciples. Let that sink in. You see, we look at this little story and we see that it happened probably in, in the matter of just moments, maybe just minutes, maybe five minutes, ten minutes. Who knows? Well, you know, they got on a boat, he was sleeping. Now, we don't know if Jesus took 30 seconds to fall asleep, five minutes, ten minutes, half hour. We don't know how long it took him to sleep, but we know this, he was asleep. And we know this, that they saw the wind and the waves and the sea tossing them to and fro, batting them around, and finally they went to Jesus and woke him up. So five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, half hour, who knows? But we know this, that Jesus, when he was done rebuking the disciples, he then rebuked the sea. You gotta understand something. Believers, Christians, we, we, may be being rebuked right now. We may be being tossed to and fro because of our lack of faith, because of our fear, and just maybe when he's done rebuking us. He will cause a great calm to come across this land. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds of the sea obey him? Listen, we know it was Jesus. They believed it was the Messiah. They believed it was the Son of God. But yet we're only seven, eight chapters in, and they were hanging out with him for about four chapters, five or six chapters right now. They didn't see the whole life of which we saw. We don't know if this happened in the first 30 days, 90 days, a year, year and a half. But we know Jesus spent time training the disciples. And the longer he spent training the disciples, the more mature they got, the more wise they got. To finally one day, three years after he began discipling them, he said what? It's time to go home. And then he left them to conquer the world. This very well could be the time in America where God is allowing the temperature, the climate, the political outcome, the financial outcome, the things that are going on in this world, it could be that God is allowing the chaos to happen to rebuke the disciples for not doing what they should have been doing in the first place, and that's having faith. Look what this is in Matthew chapter number 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28, Scripture says this. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. This is our Savior. For I am meek and lowly in heart. You understand that it very well could be that God is doing something in our nation because of the lack of meekness and lowliness in heart that Christians have in this world. You know, there's a song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And yet there's a lot of believers who take stock in the things of the world, the homes, the cars, the finances, the clothes, the wallets, the bank accounts, 
And their eyes aren't on the promised land. Their eyes are on the land in which we live in. Learn of me. This is our Savior. Learn, of, learn to be meek. Learn to be mild. Learn to be patient and kind and long-suffering. Hey, I'm just like you. When someone says all evil of men are against me, the flesh gets that sense that you want to retaliate. When they were persecuting Jesus right before they nailed him to a cross, they were interrogating him. And what was his response? Thou hast said. He didn't call down a legion of angels. He said, thou hast said. He told them what they were saying was true. He didn't try to fight it. He agreed with them. And the scripture tells us when someone takes your coat, what do you give them? Everything you have. When someone smites you on the left cheek, what do you give them? The right cheek. Wow. Meek and lowly in heart. You ready? And ye shall find rest unto your soul. You know why there's no rest right now in America? There's no rest right now because there's not a lot of meek people in America. What do you mean meek? It means they have great strength, but they don't go out there and show everybody their great strength. They act kind and humble and patient and long-suffering and tender towards people. There used to be a day and age where we could sit down with somebody across the aisle from us and we could have a peaceable conversation about politics, about religion, about anything. And if we didn't agree with them, that's okay. We could still be friendly. You can't find that in America anymore. There's turmoil. Whose fault is it? Christian, it's your fault. You look at me and say, why is it my fault? It's your fault because you are supposed to take the salt into the world. The salt slows down the decay. If you're not taking the gospel in tenderness, in meekness, in kindness, in lowliness of heart, guess what? When people act out, it's our fault because we're not doing enough to reach their soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, you've heard it said that before you get saved, you have no conviction you're doing anything wrong. You go here, you do that. You go there, you do that. You hang out with this person, you do this. There's no conviction. You just, you just do what you want to do. It seems like life was easy before you got saved. And now you're saved. You can't go here, you can't go there, you can't do that, you can't say this, can't talk about that. How's that easy? It's easy because he removed the burden from you. The burden of sin. And then you begin to learn other new things and how amazing God really is. I want to end with this. We're not going to get through everything, but I want to end with this. Psalm 148. I've had a lot of people ask me, Pastor, what are we going to do? How do we get through this? How do we talk about this? How do we deal with this? What's going on? I don't know. I'm not God. I'm not Nostradamus. I don't have a little magic eight ball. <laughs> but whenever I find myself having a hard time getting through whatever I'm going through, I always try to find a portion of scripture that helps float my boat and carry me through. Turn me, if you would, to Psalm 148. Psalm 148, verse number one. 
Praise ye the Lord. Hey, listen, my friends. When you don't know what to do, when you have no idea what's going on, when you don't know what to say, just go to this psalm and just read it out loud. Uh, Yeah, God hears your voice when you don't talk. He knows your mind. He knows your heart. He knows when you pray. You ever pray quietly? You don't say anything? Yeah? You get on your hands and knees, you're praying, and all of a sudden, five minutes later, you're sleeping, right? (laughs) But you're praying to the Lord. What, what does God want? God wants to talk. You know, God knows your heart. He knows, you've got the Holy Spirit living inside you. But God wants to talk to you. He wants to communicate with you. And if you've got a voice, use your voice for the glory of Jesus. Amen? Look what it says. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him. Ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens, yet let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He hath also established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all the hills, fruitful trees and all the cedars, beasts and all the cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of earth and all the people, princes and all the judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth in heaven. He, al- he also exalteth the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him, praise ye the Lord. Guess what? It doesn't stop there. Keep going. There's more goodness. There's more praise. Look what it says. Psalm 149. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. You ever sing a song? You don't know what song it is. You just make up a song as you go. Remember, remember when you did that when you were a kid? You walk outside. And you're just singing yourself. You're making up all kinds of words. Listen, just start praising God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Save me. You just start praising God. Who cares if people think you're crazy? You're praising the Lord. Make a new song up. Some of y'all, the only way you smile is I turn you upside down. (laughs) Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praises in the congregation of the saints. Walk in here singing to Jesus. Why do you think when you walk in most times you come in here, there's music playing? What's the purpose of it? To get you to sing, to set the mood, to get the heart right. Why do you think we sing in songs before we get up here and preach the gospel? Why do you think Tyron sings special? My wife sings special. My kids sing special. You may sing a special. What's the purpose of it? To sing and get your heart right, to get ready for the word of God. Sing unto the Lord. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise him in the let him let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with a timbrel and with a harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand. Praise the Lord with your mouth. And with the hand, have the word of God ready to start slaying things. Amen? It's not done. Keep what Lucas says. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with the fetters of iron. To execute upon them judgment written this hour. Have all the saints praise ye the Lord. Amen? Guess what? It's not done. Look at Psalm 150. Look what it says. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of trumpet. Praise him with a psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments or organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. 
He says, if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what gets you excited. Just stop praising God. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know if you had a good day today or you didn't have a good day today. I don't know if you're upset. I don't know if you're happy. I don't know if things are going good or things are going bad. But I know this. Jesus is still on the throne. Maybe you're praying for a miracle. Maybe you're praising him for an answered prayer. I don't know. He's still on the throne. You want to see God do something great in our nation? It begins with the one looking in the mirror. Don't be average. Be different. God didn't create you to be average. God created you to be crazy. Crazy for him. So start praising him wherever you go. And if you don't know how to praise him, just rip out that page. You just start walking around. Praise ye the Lord in the firmaments. Praise ye the Lord in the church house. Just start praising him. Why? You're going to have bad days. You have days you don't want to get out of bed. You have days that you want to crawl under a rock. You can have days that you don't want to leave. You're going to have days that you're like, what am I doing? What is this world all about? You know, my first couple nights in prison, I had no idea why God allowed me to go there because I didn't know God at the time. And it wasn't until my pastor led me in a relationship with Jesus Christ that I realized God brings you places to do something with you. And wherever you've been, whatever you've been through, whatever you're in right now, God is bringing you through it to do something with you. God knows the torments, the fear, the anxiety. God knows your life. He knows your background. He knows all the stuff that's ever happened to you. He knows all the stuff that you're going through right now. He knows the things that you're thinking right this moment. And guess what? He still loves you. And what is he looking for? Don't be afraid. Have more faith. And when the storm is surrounding you, tossing you to and fro, run to Jesus. And ask him to rebuke the wind and the waves. And begin to praise him through the trials. Through the storm. Through the tribulation. The best way you can praise God is to put yourself in the offering plate. And say, here I am. I give you my life. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we're here tonight and we love you, we thank you, we praise you, we give you the honor and the glory. You are worthy and worthy alone to be praised. Lord, our nation and our world need peace and the only way we are going to see peace is through clinging on to this two-edged sword, otherwise known as the Bible. Lord, in this fearful and unknowing time in our life, may you allow us to have the words to say 
and the reason for our faith should someone ask us. Lord, may we begin to praise you tonight and all this week that no matter what happens in our lives, in our nation, with our election, with riots or rumors of wars, Lord, would you teach us to praise you? And God, would you allow your Holy Spirit to fill us like we've never been filled before, which at the same time means purging us the way we've never let you purge us before. Lord, we were born into this world naked and afraid, and humans put clothes on us and fed us and changed us and fed us and changed us, and then we grew. Lord, let us not hide behind the things of the world, but let us be naked, spiritually speaking, before you, that you could do something great and marvelous in our lives. Father, help us to stop playing games and get serious with our walk for you. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Teach me to praise you all the time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.